Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. So thanks for joining me today uh, over Zoom. Uh, we're going to be um, moving along and getting into topic 13 today. So sorry, I had to change things up a little bit this week. I'll, uh, I'll tell you about it next week, maybe. Um, yeah, so hopefully everyone had a chance to review the lectures on topic 12. I'm sorry if um, it was not as ideal as I'd hoped. Um, and I know there's a lot of content there, but we do have to move on. We're going to be moving on and talking about the uh, immune system now. And uh, my understanding is that you do a little bit on the immune system in your anatomy class. Uh, I'm not sure if you have covered that part yet, but uh, there might be a little bit of overlap. I'm sure the emphasis will be very different. So take a, a look at the notes there I have on the screen. Uh, if you could just keep your microphone and camera off so we're not distracting others unless you want to ask a question. If you'd like to ask a question, you can do so by uh, unmuting and you can just interrupt me. It's not a big deal and uh, ask your question or you can put a comment in the chat box. And usually I notice that within a, you know, re relatively quickly and I can I can respond to that as well. So this lecture is being recorded and um, I will uh, I will post the recording for everyone to review in the future. Uh, if you want to use it for studying purposes. So I'm hoping to, uh, I'm pretty sure I'll get through the first part of topic 13 and maybe a little bit into the second part. We'll see how far we get. And uh, so, yeah, let's talk about the immune system. So part one, uh, we're going to be talking about innate immunity. And uh, I will uh, I'll get into what that is here in a moment. But uh, the immune system is kind of the next part of the story of medical microbiology. We were talking about so far about all these uh, pathogens and how, um, how they can cause disease, right? But the other prong of the story is us, of course, and how we can prevent causing disease. And uh, if we think about all the pathogens that we're exposed to on a regular basis, it's actually quite incredible we don't get sick more often. Uh, but the good news is we have a very, very good immune system, and uh, it's it's also a very complex topic. And so we're really just scratching the surface in medical microbiology, unfortunately. But I uh, hope you find the immune system very, very interesting. So I found um, this is based on a video I found on YouTube that's really good. And just to try to emphasize how complex the immune system is, if you think about all the jobs the immune system has or the tasks, uh, there's a few, right? Uh, we're trying to kill pathogens. We're trying to uh, uh, many different types of pathogens. Uh, we're trying to prevent cancer. Uh, we're trying to, you know, we have body parts that have to communicate. Uh, there's search and destroy functions. Uh, there's, there's so many things going on here. And uh, we're going to get into some of those things. If you look at the number of cell types and tissues, uh, at least 20 different cell types. Uh, and, uh, and each of these cell types has multiple jobs. So very, very complex. If you want to look at kind of a primer on the immune system, check out this video here. And uh, it's uh, it's actually a pretty good video that really emphasizes how complex the immune system is. And you can see all those weird words and names of different cell types and all that. Um, so, you know, check that out. Uh, there's a lot of really good videos on the immune system. I'll try to post some of them to the uh, Facebook group and uh, that are good for reviewing for this this uh, this topic. So the way we have this broken down is I have it broken down into two topics uh, that cover the immune system. And then the third part is going to talk about immune deficiencies. And uh, so uh, so let's get into that. But what I want to do first before I, I, I want to kind of break down and show you what topic 13-1 and topic 13-2 look like. And uh, what we're going to do is break the immune system into three parts or three lines of defense. So if you take a look at an innate immunity, uh, innate immunity is something that you're basically born with. We don't have to develop it. And uh, the thing about innate immunity is it's nonspecific. And it's, uh, it's there right now, so it's fast. So innate immunity includes like the skin. So the skin's already there. We don't need any time for it to activate or anything like that. So we're looking at, you know, usually minutes to hours is what we're looking at. So minutes two hours. Um, I'll be right back. Just got to deal with something.
sorry about that. Just uh, dealing with something at home here. Um, okay, so um, we'll get to adaptive immunity there in a second, but um, I'm just making a table here. So it's gonna be separated like that. And then innate immunity has two parts. We'll call the first line of defense and the second line of defense. So the first line of defense is really, for the most part, physical barriers. Physical barriers. And so that includes, as I mentioned, the skin. We also have uh, surfaces in our body called mucous membranes. So those are the, uh, the surfaces that line our uh, gastrointestinal or re uh, reproductive tracts and things like that. So mucous membranes. And um, the physical barriers also include our normal microbial flora. So our flora is protecting us from pathogens. So this is something we talked about in the last unit. So the second line of defense is really uh, highly connected to the first line. And this is uh, usually includes what we'll call chemical and cellular uh, defenses. So chemical, cellular defenses, responses, and maybe the word response is better. So what does this include? This includes uh, phagocytes. So a phagocyte is something we'll talk about today. These are uh, white blood cells that eat other things. Um, this includes all sorts of antimicrobial substances, antimicrobial chemicals and substances. Writing over to that other section a little bit. Uh, and then processes such as inflammation and fever. So I do have all this written down, by the way, in the slides, but I find it's just a little bit better if I kind of slow myself down to uh, go through uh, what this is all about. Uh, so that is what we're going to talk about today. And then a little bit into part two is, is the plan. So part two, if you can imagine that if I've mentioned that, uh, that uh, the innate immunity is nonspecific and fast, that means adaptive immunity is specific. So that means it's remembering a previous infection and it's going to be very, very specific about it. Um, so maybe I'll put that. So we'll say memory. And it's, a, I don't want to say slow, but it is slower. And we're looking at in many cases, you know, depending on the type of immunity, uh, you know, 12 hours at a minimum. Uh, but in many cases, you're looking at a day or two, right? Uh, to, to really have uh, some sort of response. So this is what we're going to call our third line of defense. And so I meant to have that line go all the way down. We'll put the third there. And this includes uh, lymphocytes. So lymphocytes, lymph means your lymph, and cytes means cells. So these are, um, are, are what we usually call white blood cells. And, uh, and antibodies. So we'll get to those in a bit. And so this includes, um, if you've heard of B cells and T cells, and also includes antibodies, which I guess I just already mentioned. So we will get into that. Like I said, I'm hoping to at least introduce uh, topic 13.2 today and, uh, and talk about it a little bit. Okay, so let's get into innate immunity. And mostly I want to think of you want, I want you to think of this as barriers and uh, sometimes chemical responses that are involved with these barriers. So let's take a look at that. I found this cute little uh, picture on Google Images that uh, that summarizes a lot of uh, the first um, line of defense of which the skin is really the big part of this. The skin is super important. It not only just keeps our body parts in, but it does a lot for our innate immune system. So let's talk about skin for a minute. Um, skin basically is a bunch of cells and uh, there's multiple layers and the outer layer is dead and uh, it's a relatively uh, flexible kind of organ. So if you had like a minor poke or a jab, it's, it's not really gonna be a big deal. 
and uh, those outer layers of cells are are dead, and they kind of just flake off, and and they're going to bring microorganisms with them. And so, just as a physical protection layer, it's good. Um, of course, if you puncture the skin, it can be a portal of entry for a pathogen, which means that uh, you know that is an entry point. But for the most part, uh, you know, skin does a pretty good job from a day to day basis. You know, when we touch doorknobs, we shake hands, we kiss people, whatever it is. Um, the skin is not usually rupturing in those kind of circumstances. So that's kind of the first part. The skin is a, is a physical barrier. And the skin has all sorts of secretions that are going to help us to keep it pathogen-free or at least kill many pathogens. Our skin, first of all, produces a lot of salt. Salt is sodium chloride, so you can see NaCl is the abbreviation for sodium chloride. This makes the environment dry, inhibits the growth of most microorganisms. You know, the exception, of course, as we've talked about in class, is Staphylococcus, uh, likes to uh, live on a salty, dry area. Of course, I have to spell Staphylococcus properly. Uh, and, uh, and But most other organisms cannot really survive there for very long. It's just too dry. Uh, something else our, our skin makes is something called sebum. So sebum is, a, is an oily substance. It's also a low pH, which means it's a little bit acidic. And uh, that also prevents growth of a lot of uh, bacteria. Most bacteria like to be at a neutral pH of seven. This, I don't know what the pH it brings it down to, but it, it does inhibit a lot of growth. <laughs> there are some organisms like the ones that cause ac that ones that cause acne that actually live on the sebum, mm -hmm. but that's that's a whole other story. Uh, something that's uh, that's uh, been getting a lot of uh, research and interest over the last number of years are these uh, antimicrobial peptides called the fencins. So uh, I think I mentioned in last lecture, anytime you see IN on the end of something, it's a type of protein. So defensin is a protein that defends, right? And uh, these are these little uh, peptides, and um, they have antimicrobial properties. Uh, there's tons and tons of research into these things because there's there's so much we don't know about them. There's multiple mechanisms. Uh, there's there's some that are found in weird ones found in frogs, and and people are hoping they can maybe someday uh, find pharmaceutical uses for them and maybe new brands of antibiotics. Who knows? Uh, but there some of them are found in your skin right now, and uh, you can see this image on the left that's showing that it's disrupting some of the the uh, membranes found in the bacteria. And anytime you disrupt a membrane, you can form holes, which can kill the organism, right? So the skin has a lot of secretions, and there's there's some things that are found under the skin as well that we're not going to call secretions, but they're um, uh, they're also part of the skin defense. And we're going to talk about a couple of those here in a minute. Uh, related to the skin is your epithelium and your mucous membranes, and these are uh, the skin is multiple cell layers. The epithelium is usually only one or two skin layers, in my understanding. And these things are secreting mucus and moisture, and, and these are lining uh, some of your uh, organ systems, so your urinary system, your digestive system, respiratory system, and all that. And uh, also portals of entry if breached. Uh, but the mucus, the whole idea is usually to trap those microorganisms and not allow them to get entry. So these are very similar to the skin. They have a lot of uh, the same kind of secretions uh, and, and a few other secretions. And some of these things are found under your skin as well or in your blood. So it's kind of, like I said, all intertwined all around your body. So let's talk about some of these here. Uh, and uh, I've got some images to show you. So we have the defensins that we just talked about a minute ago. And uh, I just mentioned the mucus for trapping microorganisms. Um, let's take a look at some of these other things, though. So lysozyme. Uh, this is an enzyme, uh, and uh, you may notice this enzyme doesn't end with A's. Most enzymes end with A-S-E. Uh, this was actually, I believe it was the first enzyme ever studied. And it's found in your tears, it's found in egg whites, it's found in your nose, and it's found being secreted in many parts of your body, such as the mucous membranes. So this is an enzyme that actually cuts peptidoglycan. So if you take a look, there's an image of peptidoglycan, Lysozyme gets in there, and you can see it's sort of like Pac-Man, chops it up, and then you end up with holes in your peptidoglycan. Uh, and if you're a bacterium and you have peptidoglycan, this is a big deal. And if you are a gram positive, so notice I have this in purple. So gram positives are most acceptable because they have a lot of peptidoglycan. Uh, most affected, I'll say. 
And so this is helping our eyes keep clean. This is, uh, like I said, all over our body and uh, doing its job being antimicrobial. So something else that's found in those mucous membranes are these um, uh, dendritic cells. And uh, th these are also found kind of underneath our skin. Um, I'll show you. There's a there's a picture of one. I'll, I'll go back to that in a second. But, but here's an actual picture of one. They're very um, um, they've they've got all these projections on them that are called uh, pseudopods, and they're kind of like arms. And I kind of think of dendritic cells. You can see there's some pictures of them over here on the left here, and you can see it's just uh, just under that epithelial layer. And I kind of think of them like guard dogs. They uh, they kind of roam around. These cells can move. They're motile, and uh, they move around like amoeba. And they're looking. They're kind of sniffing around, looking for stuff. And uh, I'll show you what, what what they're doing and how they work here in a moment. Um, so they're looking around and and they're 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 doing things, right? There's the cartoon I found. You can you can see uh, it says put your dendrites in the air like you don't care. So just a little cartoon on that with these. Uh, these little arms are called pseudopods or dendrites, and they're uh, they're able to grab onto and latch onto uh, bacteria and other things. So I think I've got a cartoon that kind of shows what they do. So there we go. There's there's the dendritic cell, right? And uh, like I said, they kind of roam around just under your skin and under your epithelial layers, a little bit like guard dogs. And when they find stuff, right? So dead skin cells. Uh, bacteria, right? So if you had a puncture or a scratch and you got some bacteria in your in your body, uh, they're going around and they're just they're they're eating it, right? This is a process called phagocytosis. Maybe I'll write that on there. Phagocytosis. We're going to talk about phagocytosis in a, in a couple of minutes, but that's the process. Phago means eating. Cytosis means the process of a cell. So cellular eating is what you can think of it as, uh, and uh, and that's what they do, right? That's kind of their job, and. Uh, you know, sometimes they detect things. They detect bacteria, and they're, and they're like, well, I, this is not human. So what do they do about that? They, they want to send out a signal. And the way it works is um, they send out the signal. I'm just looking. I thought there was a different picture there. Um, there's a couple different ways to send out a signal, but uh, one of the ways they do it, it's kind of a weird way to think about it, is they actually take a piece of the bacteria, and they hold on to it. And they put that on the surface of their cell. And this is an alarm for other immune cells to come and take action. I kind of think going back to the guard dog analogy, you can picture a, a movie where the guard dog is chasing somebody down and it, it rips a piece of their pants. And then the security guard comes and sees the piece of pants in the guard dog's mouth. That's how I think of a dendritic cell. And so it's a warning. And then security can call other, other security or other white blood cells are, are recruited and uh, then they decide what kind of uh, immune response is going to be. Is it going to be inflammation? Is, are they going to recruit B cells? Uh, it can basically activate other parts of the immune system. And that's what dendritic cells do. Uh, <laughs> there are different types of dendritic cells all over the body. I'm not going to get into all of those. So another system, this is really important for our, um, our respiratory tract, is the mucociliary escalator. So you can see muco is for mucus, and ciliary is for cilia. So you may remember we were talking about cilia way, way back in topic five. We're talking about flagella and cilia. Cilia are these little uh, finger-like projections that are found in some cells. So you might have a paramecium, a paramecium. You know, kind of looks like this. It's got the cilia all over its surface, and it's using them to kind of, they're like little paddles, and they can swim around. So we have those same cilia in our body, and they're all down the cells of our respiratory tract. And um, what they do is they, put, rather than moving the cells, they're moving liquids. They're pushing mucus. So we have all this mucus down our respiratory tract, and the, the ciliary escalator moves the mucus up and if there's anything trapped in the mucus, like you can see that animation, those little uh, those little bacteria, they get trapped in the mucus and then they get pushed out. And so this is trying to keep our respiratory tract sterile or at least as, as near sterile as possible is the whole idea. Uh, where does the mucus go? We, we just swallow it. Um, it's not really a big deal for the most part. We don't even know we're swallowing mucus. The exception is when you're sick, right? When you're sick, you make a whole bunch more mucus than you might cough it up or whatever or you're 
you're, you know, you're feeling it and it's a little more unpleasant. Uh, but that's a good thing because we're trying to protect our respiratory tract. That's the whole idea behind this. And so when you're sick, produce more and maybe you can expel more pathogens. So one more um, part of, uh, of our, our first line of defense is worth to mention is the lacrimal apparatus. So this is basically uh, these glands that are found around your eyes and they produce tears, right? And uh, so your your eyes are kind of continually washed with uh, with tears, which which is really just water and a little bit of salt and a little bit of lysozyme. There's probably something else in there, but that's about it, right? So salt and a lysozyme. So remember, just like going back to the skin, the salt uh, inhibits a lot of microorganisms. The lysozyme will kill a lot of gram positives. And this will actually go through this canal that gets drained into your um, into your sinuses. And uh, again, this is something we don't normally notice because we're just kind of swallowing it, and it's uh, it's it's in a small amount. But if you're sick, you might uh, you know you might have a lot more, and so you end up with a runny nose or whatever. And uh, so this here, by the way, is a portal of entry. So if you shake somebody's hand and they sneezed in their hand and they have a cold or, or you know, rhinovirus or something, and then you go and rub your eye later, uh, now you could be introducing that virus. It's going to it's going to go into your eye. It's going to go through the lacrimal apparatus and then infect your sinuses. So this could be a, a portal of entry. All right. And lastly, this is just a reminder from last lecture, is that we also have our normal flora that can protect us. And uh, so they are protecting us by occupying space and not allowing other organisms to get there. And they produce things such as acids and antibacterial proteins, such as bacteriosins that can prevent the growth of, of, uh, of pathogens. So that's about it. That is our, um, our first line of defense. The big one, you know, is the skin. And I have to think of the first line of defense is the skin and its secretions. Uh, you may notice there's a few other things mentioned here, like our stomach acid is acidic, and so not all pathogens can make it through. Um, we could talk about, um, for example, your urethra when you urinate. Uh, you know, we've got um, um, the expulsion uh, from your urethra of microorganisms because your urine is, is only going in one, one direction. Uh, you, know, you know, so there's, I think there's a table in the textbook that lists a few other things that can be considered that. But think of the skin and secretions and the lacrimal apparatus. And uh, that's kind of really what I want you to take away from this first part, the first uh, uh, line of defense. Okay, so sorry if this is a little bit less interesting. It's kind of like just a big a list of things. It does get more interesting as we get into the um, uh, adaptive immunity. Uh, but the second part of innate immunity are these uh, are these mechanisms and chemicals and, and cells. And uh, this is where it gets really, really complex. And I'm going to try to just um, talk about a few parts. And if you go to the textbook, I know there's a lot of things that I'm not going to talk about. Try not to get too caught up in, in uh, the things that I don't talk about. Um, if you want to learn them, great. Uh, just keep in mind the textbook goes into this in a bit more detail than is really needed for this course. Uh, and so do focus on what's in the lecture notes and actually giving them the lectures uh, for, for your uh, final exam. So innate immunity, like I said, we're looking at the blood uh, and other fluids of the body, and we're looking at a lot of chemical processes and, uh, and some cellular responses. So let's, let's talk about those here. Let's start with the blood. So there's your blood, right? That's a whole bunch of things. Uh, we've got uh, red blood cells are the thing that makes it red. We've got liquids. We've got other types of cells. Uh, and uh, here's kind of a list of, of what's in the blood. Um, so anything that's not a cell is we call plasma. And the plasma is, is liquid. It's not just water. Uh, we've got electrolytes in there. We've got dissolved gases. So we, we breathe oxygen. We have dissolved oxygen. We expel dissolved carbon dioxide, uh, nutrients. So if you've eaten, you might have sugars or amino acids in there. And there's a whole bunch of proteins. Some of those proteins are involved in uh, in blood clotting, and uh, some of them are involved in these immune processes that we are, are going to talk about. So we'll talk about some of these processes here, uh, inflammation, complement, antibodies, and so on. And we'll talk about some of those. If you take a look at the cells, we have the red blood cells, also known as urethrocytes. 
And we also have platelets. Those are involved in blood clotting. We're not going to talk about those in this course. And then the leukocytes, uh, which are white blood cells. So you can use either name, leukocyte, white blood cell. Either name is fine with me. I probably will slip into and call them both at some point. And the leukocytes are the ones involved in the, um, in the immune responses. Uh, here's a chart. There's a similar one in the textbook. I like this one a little bit better. And you can see it's starting off with a stem cell up here. And the stem cell differentiates. And so over here, you can see on the right, these are your urethrocytes, so your red blood cells and a few other things. Um, not important in, in your platelets. So not so important for immunity. So we're just going to kind of ignore those. But over there on the left, you can see we end up with uh, uh, lymphocytes over here. So lymphocytes, these are part of your adaptive immune response. And then we have all these other weird things here. And I want to talk about them a little bit and, uh, and what those are. So we've got neutrophils, dendritic cells, macrophages, and so on. And uh, unfortunately, I, am, I actually have some models of these things I was going to bring to class today. Uh, so maybe if I remember, I'll bring them next week. They're just these cute little plastic models. And uh, so you get an idea of what they what they look like, because this is very cartoony here. And, and you know, they're, it's colorful. They're not really colored like that. But uh, so you can see that, you know, we've got all these cells involved in different things. And notice there's overlap here between the adaptive response and innate response. That's something we'll get into. The immune system, you know, the skin doesn't work on its own. The adaptive immune system doesn't work on its own. Everything is all integrated and working together in this big complex thing that we call an immune system. Um, yeah, I guess no questions at this point, but uh, let me know if you have any. Just add them in the chat, please, or you can uh, interrupt me at any time. So here's some here's some of these cells I want to talk about a little bit here, some of these immune cells. So the lymphocytes, like I said, lymph really just means lymph, and cyte means cell. And these are uh, the B cells and T cells. So B plus T cells. We're going to talk about them when we, when we get to the adaptive immunity. So we'll get there in a minute. Um, these other cells here, macrophage, so anytime you see phage, phagocytes, uh, that means it's a cell that eats things. So the dendritic cells are phagocytes. So we're going to talk about phagocytosis here in one minute. I think it's actually on the next slide. Um, so that's one way that these immune cells can kill things is phagocytosis. Uh, there's another way we'll call for an example, for now we'll call it non-phagocytic killing. Uh, and I'll get to that in a minute. And they all have kind of different roles uh, in the body. And uh, you can see some of them are involved in inflammation, the eosinophils, so that's this one here. That one's part of the allergic response. And so they all kind of have their own roles, but a lot of overlapping roles as well. So there's some stars, by the way. Uh, those are the ones I want you to know, uh, know those words. So lymphocyte, macrophage, eosinophil, and dendritic cell. Um, those are the ones that I specifically want you to learn what they mean, okay, uh, and and what their what some of their roles are. All right, so let's talk about phagocytosis. Um, so this is, uh, I believe, ancient Greek, and it means something like eating or eater, and uh, cyte means cell. So phagocyte is a cell that eats, right? Uh, phagocytosis is the process. So oxus is, means a process, is the process of cellular eating. And so a phagocyte is a cell that eats another one by engulfing it and destroying it. So I'll show you what this looks like in, in terms of the immune response. So first thing that happens is a, a process called chemotaxis. That means that the phagocyte is attracted to the, um, uh, the pathogen, right? Or it could be a response to something else, right? Uh, and there's, there's different... Uh, mechanisms for attraction. For example, if you puncture your skin, uh, you might get a little inflammation. Inflammation uh, produces uh, histamines. Histamines are actually an attractant for a lot of these immune cells. So that's what histamines actually do. They attract phagocytes. So they move along a little bit like amoeba. There's the cell moving along there. And uh, then they, they extend their... Uh, let me just go back to that previous slide. So you can see here, pseudo... Podium, so that means pseudo means fake. Podium means something like feet. I don't know if it's exact translation, but feet or foot or something like that. Uh, that's that's uh, that projection, right? 
So you can see over here the pseudopods, that's the plural. Uh, so they they are these little projections and they wrap around the, the pathogen, right? And so if you're a pathogen with a capsule, uh, you might be a little slippery and then maybe they can't grab on, but uh, but that's the first step is these this attachment with these uh, these pseudopods. You can see a nice electron uh, micrograph there in the in the bottom corner. Uh, then they get brought in, and so um, you can call this a phagosome, or some textbooks call these uh, food vacuoles. So the um, the microorganism is surrounded in a in a piece of membrane, basically. And then what happens is the uh, the food vacuole or the phagosome it merges with a lysosome. So remember lysosome from our very first or maybe second lecture. A lysosome is a uh, we'll call this a cellular stomach. It's an enzyme that has or it's an enzyme. I mean an organelle that has enzymes in it, uh, digestive enzymes. It's also acidic, so it's very much like a stomach. And uh, so this fuses with the pathogen, and then you can see the pathogen is basically getting digested and destroyed. So um, eventually, uh, the destroyed microorganism uh, often the products of it get released in some cases, and uh, as I mentioned, with a dendritic cell, it actually holds on to a piece of its cellular surface. There's different mechanisms based on different cells, and I'm not going to get into all these details. But sometimes this is important for propagating the immune response to alert other cells that there is something going on here, and uh, and uh, basically amplifying the immune signal. So that's that's phagocytosis. I've got a video here. Hopefully, uh, why is it? There we go. Let's see if I can play this for you. And uh, you can see some phagocytosis in action here. So here goes. Okay, so cute little animation there on phagocytosis. So that, that's what a lot of these cells are doing, right? They're, that's how they're killing pathogens. Important concept. Um, I'm just gonna go back a couple of slides here uh, and back to the cell types here. So these ones here, these macrophages and these dendritic cells are doing a lot of phagocytosis. Um, so what are these other ones doing? So that's what I wanna talk about next here. So notice I called it a non-phagocytic killing. Um, and uh, oh, there's, there's a couple more pictures of phagocytosis from our textbook. So sorry, I forgot about that slide. Uh, I just thought the video was much better. You can see it happening in action. So take a look at this one here on the right though. So notice that this, uh, this macrophage here is engulfing a yeast cell. Um, it probably can't really do anything much larger. Like that's that's a lot. It's maybe biting off more than it can chew, um, but it can handle it, right? But anything bigger than that. So think about all the pathogens that might be bigger. We've got parasitic worms. Um, our immune system destroys cancer cells, which are our own cells, which are much bigger than a yeast cell. Uh, we can have uh, all sorts of uh, weird protozoan parasites that are that are too large to destroy by phagocytosis. So we need another mechanism. And, uh, oh, oh, yeah, I forgot about this slide as well. This is showing phagocytes all over the body. A lot of them have special names based on 
um, you know, what cell, what uh, tissues they're in. There's the dendritic cells down there. You can see we've got the uh, cup for cells. Um, I think there's another one called Langerhand cells. And uh, there's a whole bunch of different types. Don't get too caught up in all the names. So um, the other type of killing, uh, there's a few different names for it. In many cases, uh, we use this term here, cytotoxic. Cytoto uh, cytotoxic killing, which I think is somewhere in the notes, and it's definitely on some of the slides. So cytotoxic, remember cyte means cell, toxic means toxic. It's, you know, there's something uh, damaging there, right? So if you take a look on the on the left here, um, there's a picture. You can see we've got this cell called a natural killer cell. Uh, that means it can kill things. It doesn't need to be activated. Some cells need to be activated, but so it's it's just a name for a type of uh, type of cell. And you can, you can see that this tumor cell here is actually much larger than it. So it can destroy it by phagocytosis. So how does it kill it? Uh, again, there's a few different mechanisms. You can sort of think of it as a kiss of death. And so this natural killer cell comes along. And if you take a look at the cartoon on the right, it actually has these little granules in there. And these granules contain toxins. And those toxins get released into the target cell and they kill the target cell. So no phagocytosis. Instead, we're just going to give you a kiss of death. And it's kind of like, you know, some spy movie where somebody's maybe wearing, you know, poison in their lipstick or something like that. And and uh, in this case, we've got these little granules full of toxins. Like I said, there are multiple mechanisms. I'm not going to get into all the details on that. Uh, sometimes apoptosis is induced. Uh, and if you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. Um, but uh, there's, there's certainly a few different mechanisms to do this cytotoxic killing. Uh, I was going to mention these eosinophils. And you can see this one here is just full of these toxins, right? Uh, tons and tons of them, right? And those, so these eosinophils are specifically uh, targeting parasites. And by parasites, <clears throat> excuse me, we're often talking about parasitic worms. So this part of our immune system is specifically uh, catered towards killing parasitic worms. Problem is, most of us, at least in Canada, are not being uh, infected by parasitic worms that often. So what do we what do we do, right? Well, these cells they sit around and they're kind of bored, uh, and um, so the problem is is a lot of these cells here start getting busy and they can cause allergic reactions. So that's right, the part of your immune system that targets parasitic worms is also the same part of your immune system that is involved in allergic reactions. So we're going to talk a little bit about allergies in topic 13-3. So we'll get there in a bit. <clears throat> Excuse me. I just got to grab a drink of water. I'll be right back. So the thing to know for now is that eosinophils target parasitic worms, but that they're also responsible for uh, allergic reactions. So there's a, there's a parasitic worm, a big fluke, right? And if you take a look, all these little guys, so each of these is an eosinophil. You can actually see the texture in them. They're full of those uh, little packages of toxins. And they're just attacking this fluke like crazy. And they're going to kill it. Okay, so that was a kind of an introduction to immune cells. And uh, I know you learn a little bit more about some of them in uh, anatomy. Um, so just, you know, for this class, try to focus on the ones that I, that I did emphasize. And, um, well, we'll talk about the, we'll start talking about the final exam here in a week or two, and a little bit in terms of what kind of content that you, you need to know. And uh, I am going to be planning a couple of uh, kind of extra review sessions for the final exam, which will hopefully help you as well with uh um, getting ready for that. So what else is in the blood? As I mentioned, the second line of defense is uh, mostly in the blood. We're looking at chemical and cellular processes. So we have some of the same things in the blood that we had in the uh, mucous membranes. So lysozyme, defensins, uh, the blood pH is not acidic or anything like that. In fact, the blood is slightly alkaline, so that doesn't help. 
but we also have these um these uh these systems and uh i'm not going to spend a lot of time on them but i'm going to briefly try to discuss them is the, these are things are really it takes a long time to do them any justice so uh, but i'll give you a quick idea of what these things look like the first one is called the complement system so if you take a look at the complement system you can see it's a set of proteins that can trigger other immune responses right so we already talked about phagocytosis we talked about cytotoxic killing we'll talk about inflammation and fever in a bit so what this is, is a system to basically activate other systems is what it is. And um, the complement system is, is many proteins, uh, about 30 of them apparently. And uh, often you'll hear it called a molecular cascade. So you're probably thinking, okay, what is a cascade? Um, so this is a cascade, right? Um, a cascade is where you have, you know, one thing leads to another thing, which leads to another thing, which leads to another thing. Uh, that's a cascade, right? So I'll show you uh, a little bit of information from the textbook about what's going on. And like I said, it's, it's very, very complicated. So I don't want you to get caught up in the details. What I want you to know is basically this here, a definition, right? This is the kind of thing that, you know, would be a true or false question or maybe a, a multiple choice question at the most. There would never be a written question on it because it's, it's, it's just a little too complex. So if you take a look at this, it says here we've got an antibody binds to a virus. Complement one gets activated when it binds to the antibody. Complement one activates molecules complement two and complement four. Complement two and complement four make complement three. Complement three activates complement five. Complement five. You get the idea. That it's like it's like you tell your friend something, and your friend tells two more friends something, and then that friend tells two more friends something, and so you know a little bit along the way, you've got this amplification of immune response. And what immune response? Well, inflammation, fever, phagocytosis, or cytotoxic killing, right? So it's just trying to amplify the immune response. Uh, here's the image from the textbook. You can see C1, C2, C4, and they all activate each other. And this leads to basically some sort of killing of, of the cell, either by phagocytosis in most cases, or the cytotoxic killing in other cases. Sometimes inflammation, but inflammation often leads to those other things as well. There's some pictures uh, in the textbook. It talks about this thing here, this membrane attack complex. We're not going to get into that, but you can see what it does here, right? It's uh, it's totally destroying the membrane of the uh, of the cell that's being attacked, putting holes in it, which is just a type of cytotoxic killing. Is really what it is. Okay, so like I said, um, complement system. Just know. A definition. No, it can work with the uh, both innate or adaptive immune system, but I'm not going to get into any other details on that. Uh, interferons. Um, I'm going to mostly skip interferons this semester. Again, it's, it's just uh, it kind of takes a while to do them any justice, but what you should know about interferons is they're antivirus proteins. And um, what do they do? They cause those things. So those symptoms probably look familiar. Headaches, fevers, chills, malaise, body aches. If you've ever had a flu or almost any viral infection, you're usually having one of those symptoms. And um, so where are the symptoms coming from? They're coming from your immune system trying to deal with the viruses. So like I said, I'm not going to get into interferons. I will not ask you about them on the test, but uh, just throwing them out there something that I do like to talk about some semesters when I have a little bit of uh, time to do so. Uh, you may have heard of some of these, interferon alpha, gamma, beta, and there's a few others. And you can see the whole idea is to be antiviral in, um, in activity. Uh, and, and they will in activate other immune cells, right? So you've got all these things trying to activate each other. And this is where the immune system gets complicated. There's so many chemicals and things like that. So we're gonna just be really just covering the basics. I do want to spend a few minutes, though, talking about inflammation, though, okay? And what is inflammation? Um, so a lot of people think of inflammation as being a bad thing. Um, it's not. Uh, it can be. Chronic inflammation or excessive inflammation can be a bad thing. And it's annoying. Um, so let's talk about that. So first of all, what is inflammation? So you can see I've got a little definition here. It's a general nonspecific response to tissue damage. So you can see in this case here, there's an image. Somebody is getting, uh, it looks like a little sliver or a thorn or something like that. 
It's a little bit of tissue damage, right? So if you have some tissue damage, what do you want to do? Well, you want to heal that, right? And you also want to protect yourself from pathogens. And so um, you get a little bit of tissue damage. And what happens is you uh, try to send a little bit of extra blood in there. Blood brings nutrients. Blood also brings, uh, you know, immune cells. And uh, it ends up swelling a little bit. Sometimes it gets itchy and warm. But all that's part of the healing process. That's good. So small amounts of inflammation are actually really good for your body. It's all part of that healing and protection process. Let's take a look at, at this in a bit more details. But you can see that image on the right. You can see we've got some swelling and redness. These are the parts we don't like because sometimes they get a little bit of pain and things like that. But uh, for the most part, short-term inflammation is, is a really, it means things are healing and that's good. Um, chronic inflammation, as I mentioned, is, is where it is bad because often you're looking at extra tissue damage. If it's in your joints, that could be arthritis. Uh, sometimes, you know, if you have inflammation from an infection, like if you had a lung infection, it could mean uh, it's going to bring more fluid in there and, and it's going to be hard to breathe and you'll have pneumonia and things like that. But uh, um, that's, that's the thing, right? Um, our body, the immune system is, uh, if you think about it, like, it's a real fickle thing. You know, you want to have an immune response, you want to have just enough, but not too much. Because anytime you have too much of an immune response, that's that's bad, right? And it's the same with inflammation. So let's take a look at some of the details of inflammation, what exactly is going on. So you get yourself uh, scratched, you get a, a puncture from a thorn or whatever, you get some inflammation, maybe you have a burn, you burnt your finger, and uh, the first thing that happens is, is blood clotting signals occur, right? Because uh, usually there's a bit of tissue damage, right? And this releases something called histamines. And there's other chemicals involved as well, but histamines are maybe the most important ones. And histamines do a whole bunch of things. So first thing they do is they cause blood vessels to dilate. So you can see in these pictures here, the blood vessels are kind of skinny on the left, and on the right, they become um, sort of larger. And so what is that going to do? That's going to enhance blood flow uh, and it's going to allow um, uh, more white blood cells to get in there, right? So if you take a look at this picture here, they're also become more permeable. So you can see we've got this monocyte here. That's a type of, of phagocyte. And you can see over here on the right, it's, uh, it's able to squeeze through the tissues and get at that damage. And so this is all good, right? We're bringing in nutrients. We're bringing in... Uh, in these uh, um, dendritic cells and other, other phagocytes, and they're hopefully gonna help us to get rid of any potential bacteria that have been introduced and uh, help with the healing process. Um, yeah, so that's really, that's inflammation, right? Is to bring phagocytes, bring in nutrients and repair the tissues. Um, there's this acronym that's been floating around forever and ever of you know, the symptoms of inflammation, right? Uh, so sharp, so S for swelling, H for heat, R for redness, P for pain, and also pus. Sometimes you get a little bit of pus in there. Pus is just some uh, some white blood cells that are, you know, filling in and and being kind of gooey in there. And that's inflammation. Okay. Um. There's a there's one more picture I found on this one. I thought this one was really good. You know, you've got, you can see the damage happening here. You've got these little histamines. The histamines are recruiting the phagocytes and, and, and all that, right? So if you have too much uh, inflammation, sometimes we can, we can treat this with antihistamines and things like that. And uh, we'll certainly talk a little bit about antihistamines when we talk about allergies uh, uh, next week or whenever we get to that. Okay, and the last process I want to talk about part of uh, innate immunity is uh, fevers. And so fevers uh, are uh, basically means your body temperature is higher than usual. And so uh, part of your brain that sets your body temperature is the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus can be sensitive to certain chemicals that we call pyrogens. So pyro, I think it means something like fire or heat. I'm not sure. I'd have to look that up. And these conclude all sorts of things. These can include interferons, um, but a whole bunch of things like bacterial toxins, uh, endotoxins are, are a good one, um, antibody antigen complexes, so basically immune response, particles released by macrophages, so immune response, right? So anytime you get an infection, sometimes these chemicals are released and they tell the body to warm up. And so why would you do that? 
Well, there's actually some chemistry behind this. Because uh, if, you, uh, if you've taken a couple of chemistry courses, you might know if you want to speed up chemical reactions, uh, you turn up the temperature. It's just basic chemistry. And so in this case, what you're trying to do is trying to uh, ramp everything up in the body. You're trying to give the immune system uh, a boost. Uh, and, uh, and, and so you turn up the temperature. A fever will also um, inhibit the growth of some microorganisms as well. Uh, and so, you know, small fevers are are good for you, right? Uh, there's sometimes problems when people get fevers and uh, it's it's too much, uh, you know, makes life uncomfortable or it can be dangerous to the body. And, and that's where, you know, people want to, uh, you know, there wants to be intervention. Um, I think I mentioned all these things. How does fever help? Inhibits growth of microorganisms, enhances macrophages, tissue repair, enhances interferons. So enhances the immune response, inhibits growth of microorganisms. Uh, fever two agony damage, I mentioned that. And uh, so there's there's different professional opinions on how much to treat fevers. Mild fevers, uh, it seems to me nowadays, I'm hearing a lot that that you know physicians and, and healthcare professionals are are saying, you know, they shouldn't be treated. We should let the body do its thing. Um, so you might hear you might hear different opinions along the way in your in your career as nurses. Okay, so so that is it for the first part of the immune system, uh, the innate immunity. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to switch gears now, and um, we're going to talk about uh, adaptive immunity. So just give me a moment to load up that uh, PowerPoint here. And uh, I guess I've got to share it as well. Where's my my Zoom prompt? Here we go. Uh, there it is there. Okay, so innate immunity. Um, meant to be a short lecture. Uh, and But don't forget it because uh, adaptive immunity and innate immunity have a lot of intertwined things. Um, so this here PowerPoint here that I have up, I don't believe I have it uploaded to Moodle. So if you'd like to follow along with the PowerPoint, I have not uploaded it yet. I still have some slides that I, I was trying to update this morning and didn't quite finish. Uh, but we won't get too far in. About 15 minutes, uh, 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 we're going to get into this. I'm, I'm hoping to get to a certain point and then uh, kind of, uh, you know, re-discuss uh, it next day as kind of our refresher on that. Okay, so let's get into this. Plus, uh, part two is, is going to, we'll, we'll talk about vaccines as, eventually as well, of course. So back to this slide here. Uh, this is what I had written on the, on the, uh, on the whiteboard before. And um, so what we talked about already now is innate immunity, which is nonspecific and fast. And we had our two lines of offense, uh, defense, our, um, our physical barriers. So mostly the skin, secretions, uh, and a few other things. Our second line of defense is the chemical and cellular responses. So we're talking about phagocytosis, cytotoxic killing, some of the processes such as the complement system, the inflammation system, and fever. And so uh, topic part uh, 13, part two, we're going to talk about the adaptive immune system. And, um, and so this is the part that most people think of when they think of the immune system. So they think of adaptive immunity. And um, so um, this is going to include uh, lymphocytes and antibodies. We talked about antibodies a little bit already, and uh, um, mostly B cells and T cells. Uh, so before we move on, I see there's a question. Someone's asking about uh, the exam. Um, I don't know if you're referring to the midterm or if you're referring to the final exam. So the midterm I will take up in class next week. Uh, the final exam, I'm hoping to have a little bit of time to talk about it next week as well, once we finish talking about the midterms, and there will be some review sessions in the last week of classes as well. So hopefully that answers your question. So let's get into adaptive immunity. Uh, so as usual, I got, I got a bunch of things to define and a bunch of things to, to talk about here before we really get into it. Um, first of all, uh, here's a nice picture. I saw this one here on the internet somewhere. And uh, it's kind of showing that the adaptive and innate immune responses, uh, they do work together, right? They do work together. So just keep that in mind. The whole immune system is integrated. Okay, so what I want to do is talk a little bit about how the adaptive immune system is different, right? 
So we're going to think of this as five features. And, and uh, so some definitions, and I want you to think about these features as we, uh, as we get into the unit, okay? Um, so the first feature you're seeing is, is specificity. So that comes from the word specific. Hopefully that's obvious. Um, so what does that mean? It means now this is, this is not a, a general immune response anymore. Now we're going to recognize a very specific uh, molecule or pathogen. We're going to call that an antigen. I'll get into what an antigen is in a few minutes. Uh, but we're recognizing something very, very specific. So if you've had, um, if you've had chicken pox or if you've had the chicken pox vaccine, right? Uh, now this part of the immune system will specifically recognize that specific molecule. So that in that case, that would be a molecule found on the varicella zoster virus, right? And that's what our antigen is. So it's very, very specific and precise. Inducibility, what does that mean? It means that this is not ramped up all the time. If we, if our immune system was ramped up all the time, it'd be like you playing all of your um, playlists all at once. It would be a mess. It would be loud. It would be terrible. It would be a disaster. So what we want is we want to have... Um, just the right cells getting activated at the right time to those specific pathogens. Okay, so that's what inducibility is. Clonality is actually related to memory, but we'll talk about what that means. A clone is a genetically identical copy. So if you have an identical twin, you're a clone. You, you two are clones of each other. Um, in the case of when we're looking at cells, uh, we're looking at cells duplicating themselves. So if we have useful immune cells, they are gonna make copies of themselves. And so now there's gonna be many of them. And so this is part of amplifying the response. This is part of having memory for the response. And so, you know, when we use that word clones, when we're talking about cells, we're talking about cells copying themselves. Okay, and like I said, important for the immune response. Uh, no response to self. This is huge. Uh, we don't want our immune system to attack our own body and destroy our own tissues. We don't want that, not at all. Um, so it's important that we have a way to kind of, you know, train our cells, we'll say, uh, or um, mature them uh, in a way that this is not going to happen. If it does happen, you might have an autoimmune disorder of some sort, uh, and, and that's not good. We don't want that. And then the last one is memory. Uh, so this basically means that we're going, you know, our immune system has a form of memory. It's going to recall it was exposed to a certain antigen before. And in the future, it's going to be able to recognize that antigen and respond really fast. Uh, in many cases, we're talking about so fast that you don't even know you're exposed to it. And, uh, and that's a good thing. That's what we want. That's the whole idea of having uh, immune memory. Okay, so keep these things in mind as we talk about everything else in this unit. Uh, specificity, inducibility, clonality, no response to self and memory. We're going to kind of get into all of these things. Okay, so five features and five components that are worth mentioning of the immune system. And uh, so all of these have their roles, and uh, we'll get into these. Again, if you've, you've taken your anatomy course, you should know a little bit about some of these things, depending on how far you've, you've covered in, in the course. Um, I don't know if somebody could comment on, on whether you've covered the immune system or not in your anatomy course. Uh, that would be great if somebody could put that in the chat. I'm just curious. Uh, but let's get into this. So first is the lymphatic system. Um, lymphatic system is kind of weird. It's something most people aren't used to thinking about. Uh, it's, a, it's a type of, um, I don't want to use this word circulatory system, but it's a system in the body that has, uh, has vessels and, uh, and it carries fluid throughout the body. It's separate than the circulatory system. The circulatory system, specifically, we're talking about blood, We've got veins and arteries, and the heart is what uh, is what pumps the blood. Um, okay, someone says you have covered the lymphatic system, so that's good. And uh, so the lymphatic system carries, we don't call it blood, it doesn't have red blood cells, we call it lymph. So lymph has a whole bunch of purposes, but it carries waste from blood, it carries uh, uh, certain nutrients, uh, after you've di after you've um, uh, absorbed them uh, through the digestive system, it carries fats and things like that, uh, and and um, it, it's parallel, right? And there's um there's parts of the immune system uh, that are called lymph nodes. So you can see there's a bunch of lymph nodes here in your in your groin area, armpits, around the neck, 
And these are just larger areas that contain lymph and lots of immune cells. And so you can think of the lymphatic system as the battleground. This is where a big part of your immune response is going to happen. And so that's what this is all about. And so often we say lymph, a lot of people are, when they say lymph, often they're talking about white blood cells, often B cells and T cells, but it does contain other things, of course. But there's the lymph lymphocytes, which are the B cells and T cells. All right, number two is antigens. So an antigen, this is the molecule um, usually found on the pathogen. So the pathogen itself is not what is recognized by the immune system. Pathogens are too large. Uh, the whole thing is not recognized. An antigen is the specific molecule on that um, pathogen. And so it could be a uh, could be a glycoprotein found on a pathogen. It could be a, a, a cellular carbohydrate. Uh, you know, some sort of capsule, capsule or, or, or slime layer found on, on a bacterium. Uh, so usually something smaller, a protein or a carbohydrate are pretty common things. Um, individual proteins can be antigens. So toxins, you can see there's a toxin right here. So for example, the uh, diphtheria toxin could be, uh, is what's recognized if you're immuni immunized by diphtheria. Your body is not immunized against the bacterium. It's immunized against the toxin, the toxin only. Um, the, um, and, and usually not even the whole part of it. Like it might be just a few amino acids or something that are part of the, uh, the protein. Um, so C are the antibodies. So the antigen, by the way, if you take a look up here, um, it, it's abbreviated often by AG. So if you see that in the notes or anywhere, that means antigen. And that's the thing that your immune system is going to bind. Uh, the part of your immune system that binds things is called an antibody. So an antibody is a B for antibody. Notice that's not antibiotic, that's antibody. Uh, they're also called um, immunoglobulins. So immunoglobulin. So immuno means your immune system, globulin means a, a, a soluble protein is basically what it means. And so sometimes you might see Ig instead. Um, so if you take a look at this diagram, uh, on the left there's a, there's a model showing the, uh, the amino acids on there. And uh, if you were to break that down, what you actually have is four proteins. And uh, if you take a look, I'll, show, I'll, I'll draw them on my other side. So we've got one, two, three, four. And so they're actually attached to one another by these things called disulfide bonds. And uh, so the shorter ones we call light chains, the larger ones we call heavy chains. You don't need to know that for this course. But what you do need to know is when they, they, um, when they attach together, they form these binding sites, these pockets that recognize your antigens. And so that's important because this is this is the whole technology behind the adaptive immune response is these antibodies being able to recognize specific uh, antigens. Uh, there's another part down here at the bottom. Uh, we call this the constant region. Uh, and this is the part that's recognized by immune cells. So these antibodies can bind something and an immune cell can recognize and, and grab onto the antibody and then do its thing. Okay, so... Uh, well, so what, what do antibodies do? Let's, let's talk about that a little bit here for a minute. Um, here's some pictures I'll show you of some antibodies. So you can see um, on the bottom here, they're recognizing different parts of the bacterial cell. So some of them are on the surface. Some of them are probably, uh, those look like uh, pili or something. So some proteins on the pili and so on. And so your, your typical bacterial cell will have many antigens. And uh, so there may be many antibodies that are recognized by your immune system to that bacteria if you've had an infection. The other thing I wanted to point out, going back to this picture, is that there are actually two antigen binding sites. And so these antibodies, they can actually multitask a little bit. And that just makes them a little bit more efficient when they have two binding sites. So let's talk about what antibodies do when they bind antigens. Okay, they do a whole bunch of things, a whole bunch of things. Uh, we've, we've got this broken down into five categories. And in the end, really what is happening is two things, phagocytosis and cytotoxic killing. Okay, so let's take a look at each of these and you'll see how they all lead to either one, one 
or two, uh, one or one or, or both of those those um, those end results. Okay. So the first thing is opsonization. So what is that? That is a fancy word, meaning stimulating phagocytosis. I don't know why we need a fancy word for it, uh, but it's it's a word you need to know that opsonization is basically stimulating phagocytosis. So if you take a look, there's our uh, our pathogen, our, our bacterium, and uh, it's recognized by an antibody, and then those antibodies are recognized by our phagocyte. And there's the phagocyte bringing it in, and it's going to kill it by phagocytosis. So that's it, all right? And that's the main goal in many of these cases is, is phagocytosis or opsonization, which means the whole stimulating of the process of phagocytosis. And this KKS on the bottom, I have no idea. I think that's a typo. I have no idea what that's from. Uh, number two, uh, some things are too big. Some things are too big to be killed by phagocytosis. So um, a term we have for that is antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity, right? So there's that word, cytotoxic. Remember I was calling it cytotoxic killing? Um, so just a fancy acronym for that. And you can see this NK over here stands for natural killer. Uh, some of them have to be activated. So there's different types of, uh, of, of these cells. But the bottom line is this is cytotoxic killing. So you can see over here, there's this uh, protein called perforin, which uh, punches holes in the membranes and, and kills it, right? So that's, uh, you know, that's basically what's going on there. So there's our two kind of uh, things that we were talking about before, phagocytosis and cytotoxic killing. Those are our two methods for, for uh, basically destroying pathogens. So nothing new. This is exactly what we talked about in the, uh, in the previous 13-1 uh, uh, lecture. Um, what else can we do? Sometimes um, antibodies activate the complement system, which is kind of like a funny thing to think about because the complement system just activates other part of the immune system. Right, as we mentioned, you know, this is a set of, of a bunch of proteins. They trigger other parts of the immune system. Uh, but what do they do? They amplify the response, right? So you're going from one cell or one antibody to hundreds to thousands of them, and that's it. And so what does that do? That leads to opsonization, phagocytosis, or the, or the cytotoxic killing. So it's really just kind of another way to get to the phagocytosis or cytotoxic killing. Okay, so the last two things are um, are kind of related, um, and and uh, so one is agglutination. So we're talking about agglutination as uh, as being used as a diagnostic test, uh, and and so agglutination means clumping. And so what what is going on here? Um, sometimes pathogens, right? Uh, the antibodies because they have multiple prongs. If you take a look, it's got a couple of uh, arms to it. Uh, it can bind multiple bacteria or whatever that's going to be there. And so this allows them to clump. And when they're clumped, uh, they're more visible to the immune system. And so this is a good thing, right? We want them to clump. We want them to be visible to the immune system. And then this leads to usually phagocytosis or sometimes cytotoxic killing. So you can see that's where everything leads is to killing the pathogen. That is the goal of the immune system is to kill these pathogens, right? So the two methods, phagocytosis, cytotoxic killing. Um, as I mentioned uh, before, this can be used for diagnostic tests, this agglutination. Uh, hemagglutination is a clumping of, uh, of red blood cells. And I think I showed you this slide or a similar one before. Uh, this is um, um, a diagnostic test for testing people's blood group, right? So you can get these antibodies, you can, you can buy them, and uh, some of them are for the A antigen, some of them are for the B antigen. So we call this anti-A and anti-B, meaning they're recognizing the A antigen or recognizing the B antigen. So if you take a look at this, if you have, um, uh, so you get a little drop of blood on a, on a, on a glass slide, you add, uh, you'd actually have two drops of blood. You'd have one with the A, either you put the A antibodies and one that you put the B antibodies. If you get clumping with A, then you have A type blood and not B-type blood. If you get uh, clumping with B, you have B-type blood. If you get clumping with both, then you have AB blood. If you get no clumping, then you have O-type blood, because O doesn't have the A or B antigens. It has diff a different antigen on it. 
Uh, so anyway, there's our, there's our just our, our recap to what agglutination was. Okay, and then the last thing that path or, or, or antibodies can do is neutralize um, a toxin or pathogen. So what does that mean? It means the antibodies coat the pathogen or the toxin, and now it can't do what it wanted to do. And this is how we have immunity, as I mentioned, against the diphtheria toxin. You can see here's an example of a toxin is coated with the antibodies, and now the toxin can't go and do damage to the, to the host. Um, in many cases, this will lead to phagocytosis as well. So probably no surprise there. The ultimate goal is destruction. But if you can neutralize something, then you can stop it from doing any damage or anything like that. Okay. Um, so five things, right? Um, I can't remember it was last year, the previous year, I asked uh, on the final exam, I actually said, you know, list and describe three functions of antibodies. Uh, so, you know, keep in mind that could be a final exam question. Uh, and uh, so, you know, you should be able to describe some of these. I would worry less about this one here since we kind of really just scraped by on the complement system. So there's four options. Um, learn at least three of them and know that they all lead to either phagocytosis or cytotoxic killing, which is cell lysis. Uh, so something else to say about antibodies is there are several types. Um, you can see they they look different. Uh, they have different uh, uh, constant regions. Sometimes they bind together in dimers, where you can see IgM binds as a, as a tetramer. It's got five parts. And they actually have different functions. Uh, and you can see here's some of the functions listed here. So IgG, for example, is involved in complement. It's involved in phagocytosis. And kind of the key thing is that this one here can actually cross the placenta. So that means that, uh, you know, um, if you're pregnant and you get uh, exposed to infections going around, uh, you're going to have an immune response and you're going to give those antibodies to the fetus. And so when your child is born, it's going to have some immunity to things moving around in the community for a few months before those antibodies disappear. And that's great, right? We want to be able to do that. We want to give immunity to our children, especially when they're first born and they don't really have a fully activated immune system yet. Um, IgA is similar. This one actually gets secreted in the milk and can survive the digestive system. And uh, so that's that's also good as well. Uh, IgM um, is, is really, really good at, uh, at doing things because it has all these prongs. You can see it's very good at binding uh, multiple pathogens. So it's kind of, uh, it's in there anyway. Uh, IgE, this one is involved in um, killing worms and also involved in the immune response uh, against, uh, or sorry, the allergic response. And so uh, that one is, uh, is unfortunate, you know, if you have allergies, sorry about IgE. And IgD, um, as far as I can tell, we don't know what it does yet. Probably involved in all these other things, probably involved in phagocytosis and, and cytotoxic killing. But uh, yeah, as far, you know, as far as we can tell, we don't know why we have that one and why we need it. Uh, I'm sure somebody has some, some ideas, but as far as I know, that's, uh, that's where we're at with IgD. So just some reminders that we did talk about uh, uses of antibodies in um, di diagnostic techniques. So we talked about the ELISA as a technique that uses antibodies. And uh, I think I've got this, the same slides I showed you before, how an ELISA works. So an ELISA has this little tray here. And uh, this tray, uh, doesn't have to be done in this tray. This is just a way to do like 96 samples, uh, uh, you know, so you can do a whole bunch at once. And uh, so the, the tray has these little plastic wells and they're coated with something that will uh, attach, to, uh, attach to proteins. And, um, the um, so you someone is going to put like a blood sample in or a saliva sample, uh, usually some sort of bodily fluid, and um, and then it's going to attach, right? And then usually the second step is adding an antibody, and that antibody is going to be specific to whatever it is. So let's say this is a blood sample, and you're testing for uh, uh, you know some sort of bloodborne, um, um, you know, let's say we're testing for plague. I don't know, it doesn't really matter. You have an antibody that binds plague and, and now it's detected, but we can't see anything yet. 
And so the technology is that there's a second antibody with an enzyme, and that enzyme produces a color when you put a, a chemical in there. And that's the whole idea, is to get these chemical reactions so that we can see and you know compare. And so if you get the color, it means you have uh, whatever it is you're testing for or not. So ELISAs can be used to test for antigens or sometimes antibodies. I think I mentioned this before, an HIV test, uh, usually people have so few viral particles in their blood when you have HIV that they're not detectable. Um, but people do have an immune response against HIV. And so when we do an HIV test, we're actually looking for antibodies against the virus. And so we can detect for those antibodies using, using the ELISA test. The other thing um, to remind you is that the uh, the rapid tests are basically uh, kind of a modified ELISA test. So I see there's a question here. It says, will we need to know the different types of antibodies and what they do for the final? No, I will not ask you that. That is just for, uh, for your information. I think it's some interesting facts, but I will not ask you that on the final exam. Okay, and the last, um, the last part of adaptive immunity are the lymphocytes. Um, so we have two types of lymphocytes. We have, uh, there's some pictures of some. You can see uh, they, they look different than the red blood cells. They have a big nucleus. And so they stain really well under certain types of stains. And um, there's two types. There's the B cells and the T cells, the B lymphocytes or the T lymphocytes. Okay, so you can use either term, B cell or B lymphocyte, T cell or T lymphocyte, either is fine. And so um, these are, these are um, interesting cells. Um, I'll, I'll get to what maturing means in a minute, but uh, on the surface of these cells, they have these receptors, and these receptors are actually antibodies uh, or modified antibodies, whatever you want, want to call them. And so each cell has one type on the surface and is a program to recognize a very specific antigen. So you might have a B cell in your body right now that is that is ready to go and ready to recognize um, an antigen found on the chickenpox virus. Okay, so what is it gonna do? We'll get to that in a minute. Um, so notice um, B is for bone marrow. Oops, I'll get to that, back to that. B is for bone marrow and T is for thymus. So that's where we get B and T cells. So I just wanna explain what this maturing means and then that will wrap up today's lecture. Um, so maturing is, uh, is this process that we call clonal deletion. Um, I know it's sort of a funny term, but if you take a look, take a look at this diagram here on the right. Uh, so you've got this, uh, this stem cell, right? And the stem cell differentiates and it makes a whole bunch of different B cells or T cells. And this is all random and it makes these antibodies. And uh, there are literally billions of possibilities of different types of B cells and T cells, right? And so it's all random. And it turns out some of these might actually recognize a human body. So this is gonna be bad. So you can see step two, it says here, you know, this is, they're tested and they're, they're, this is done in the bone marrow or the thymus. And any here that might recognize human, so self antigens would be your body. These ones get deleted. So they get killed off and destroyed before they go out into the human body. And then we end up with these mature lymphocytes. And these here are, um, are ready to go and they're not going to um, uh, hopefully uh, damage the human body. So the T cells do this in the thymus and the B cells do this in the bone marrow. So I think... Um, yeah, I think that's where I'm going to finish off today. I'll probably, um, I think what I'm going to do is uh, uh, when we come back after the reading week, I'm going to recap a couple of these things, and then we're going to get into the adaptive immune response. But uh, I think that's probably a good place to finish. And uh, um, I know um, this is a lot of material. And uh, like I said, I'll hand back the midterms next day, and we'll talk about the final exam a little bit, and, and hopefully have... Uh, have an idea of how we can uh, move forward for the rest of the semester. So thanks for coming out this morning. I will uh, have this recording available for everybody uh, once I get a chance to put it up. And uh, I will see everybody uh, next week. Don't come on Tuesday. Tuesday is the reading day. 
uh, but we will have normal classes will resume next Thursday.